Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Glass features prominently in the world of displays and solar cells. Just take a solar powered calculator as an example. Both the segmented display and solar cell will be covered in a piece of glass. Now that puts limits on the minimum thickness of your application and makes it challenging if you wish to move to a curved design for your housing. However, there are plenty of applications looking for innovations that help increase battery life while enabling compact dimensions. For example, both segmented displays and solar cells can be printed onto plastic film using the latest roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing technology. The result? Flexible alternatives to traditional glass-based components. To find out more about these new technologies, my experts for this episode are Philip Holgerson from Invisible and Jonas Bergfist from Epishine. So welcome, Philip. Let me just pull you up there onto the stage. Great to see you. Hello, thank you very much. So uh, can you tell us briefly about Invisible and what your role is there? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Philip Holgersson and I'm the head of product for Invisible. Uh, I'm an engineer located in Sweden and uh, five years ago I co-founded Ardot, where we were developing electrochromic displays. A couple of years ago we were acquired by Invisible and since then I've been uh, continuing the development of our ultra low power e-paper displays. So it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Super, thanks very much for stay in the line because I'm just going to uh, introduce Jonas and we'll talk to you one to one in a moment. And hi, Jonas Bergfist, great to have you on the show. Uh, so tell me. Thank you, happy to be here. Thanks. So uh, tell us a little bit more about how Epishine, Epishine helps its customers and what's your role in the organization? Yeah, so Epishine, uh, we are manufacturing uh, printed solar cells uh, based on uh, organic uh, molecules. And uh, my role in the organization is uh, CTO, so, so I'm leading the, the uh, technology and material development at the company. Fantastic, super. Mm -hmm. Well, we look forward to finding out more uh, with our questions later on in the show. See you soon shortly. Now, this episode is sponsored by Downstream Technologies, whose software helps engineering organizations optimize and automate the PCB release process. Downstream's tools redefine how engineers and PCB designers post-process their designs to create and distribute all the deliverables required for a complete PCB assembly release package. Their flagship product is the CAM350, which provides verification and optimization before PCB designs are transferred to the fabricator, helping ensure the successful manufacturing of bare PCB boards. Another highlight is Blueprint PCB, which uses its CAD database to quickly produce comprehensive documentation that drives PCB fabrication, assembly, and inspection processes. More information about Downstream can be found at downstreamtech.com. Now, displays are the face um, most applications provide to their users. And I've been fascinated to see how displays have developed to offer really ultra low power consumption over the years, and also um, seen the growth of energy harvesting technology to power such applications. Hopefully, you've got just as many questions for my guests as I have. Regardless of where you're watching, join in the conversation by posting your questions and comments during the show. Simply use the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn, or tweet us on Twitter or X, or whatever they're calling themselves this week, using hashtag ElectorEI, and we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So let's get back to Philip. Bring him up here. Hi. So, Hello Philip, again. great to have you on the show. Um, what I wanted to start with is, I think if, if anyone thinks about sort of a, a low cost, low power choice for an LCD, it's, it's probably segmented LCDs. They've, they've been the sort of low power choice for displays. We see them, as I said at the beginning, everywhere from calculators to thermostats. Um, I mean, in your opinion today, are they still really low power? And in, in what sort of applications do they show their weaknesses? I mean, I would say that the LCDs are uh, quite low power. 
but the problem with them is that they are in general not bi-stable. So LCDs require continuous power, while, for example, our display, the invisible e-paper, maintains its state, its state for long periods without consuming any additional power. So in static mode, uh, basically when the content of the display is, keen, is being kept in the same state, uh, the invisible display consumes about 90% less compared to an LCD of the same size. I see. So um, when when we when we sort of look at the that that sort of technology, um, most engineers I think would be aware of um, the e-paper products uh, that are on the market, such as the the Kindle e-book reader and, and the e-paper displays that go inside those. Are invisibles displays operating in the same way as those? I mean, I think uh, even if we belong to the same category being e-paper displays. The underlying technology is fundamentally different if we compare these two technologies. So the technology used in the Kindle, for example, is called electrophoretic displays, which is based on charged pigments being rearranged by an electric field. Our technology, on the other hand, is an electrochromic technology, meaning that our materials with the help of electric signals can be altered on a molecular level and as a result undergo a color change. So uh, in addition to that kind of significant difference in, uh, in operation, the materials that we are using are formulated as inks, which means that we can screen print our devices, which gives us a very significant cost advantage compared to the technology, the technology that is being used in the Kindle device. But on the other hand, we're also very similar. I mean, both technologies share the benefits of being reflected, uh, which makes us super uh, power efficient and also very readable in sunlight, for example. So yeah, it is it is relatively similar, but also very different. Yeah, exactly. So um, I was looking at the, the website, obviously, be before talking to you to, to today and uh, trying to understand a, a little bit more about the technology. Um, one of the things that stated is that um, these electrochromic materials are organic and not being a sort of a scientist or a material scientist, I'm an electronics engineer. Um, is is when, when organic is used like that, is that, is that like organic vegetables or organic apples, meaning it's non-harmful to the environment? Or what does that mean, organic electrochromic materials? Uh, I mean... Yeah, I think uh, on that question, I want to be clear that I don't recommend anyone to eat the display as they are printed <laughs> on a plastic substrate, which may lead to some mechanical issues in the digestion system, of course. Uh, <laughs> but what we mean there is basically that we're using materials that aren't harmful to the environment. So one example of that is our display is, is, uh, is basically the uh, unique in the fact that, the, that it is not using any ITO. Uh, which contains indium, which is a scarce metal, which is widely adopted in the electronics industry. Most likely it's the material that you look to when you look at your display right now, because it's a transparent conductor that is extremely useful for displays, but also very scarce metal. So, uh, and we can avoid that, which is great. And one of the things uh, with LCD, um, standard LCD technology is, um, they, they they can be quite compact, um, mostly the the most mostly square, which is sort of uh, I think one of the one of the boring bits about displays is uh, we've only recently started to see say circular displays uh, come onto the market, but they they obviously require a certain amount of thickness um, of glass on them to support them and provide some sort of robustness. Is that also the case for your type of displays? You need some some glass or some sort of uh, at least a, 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 a certain thickness in order to to make it um, robust. I mean, not not in the same way, really. Uh, our displays are significantly thinner, uh, about two hundred and fifty microns or a quarter of a millimeter. Wow. And instead of glass, we are actually using PET. Um, and the, I mean, compared to uh, liquid crystals, our all our materials are solid state. So that means that we can print them on top of each other and we don't need any strong kind of mechanical support to maintain the uh, structural integrity, to put it like that. So that means that we can we can actually bend our devices and attach them to curved surfaces and, and stuff like that as well. And so when you're bending those displays, there's, there's no risk of the, the sort of the, the organic material that's in, in there sort of, of squeezing in, a, in, in an area where you don't want it. Um, 
or, or, or for mean, example, no. if you had something that, that, that twisted, bent it a lot of times over its lifetime, um, sort of a, a bit like these foldable smartphones that you can get today, is, is there a risk that there's sort of uh, damage through that over time? I mean, certainly there is uh, the, there is a risk for uh, for that kind of issues over time if you bend them a lot. Um, but there is there is a huge difference in the fact that you, we can bend our devices, we can them bend them many times. Uh, but I mean, if if the idea is to to bend them um, like a, like a smartphone, for example, like multiple um, tens hundreds of times every day, maybe. Yeah, but then it, it may be something that, that we need to test and evaluate more carefully. Uh, that's a very rare request, by the way, also for, for customers. In general, you, you may want to put them around a curved surface, uh, but it's very rare that you actually need kind of the bending feature. Um, so, uh, yeah. but yeah, in theory, it's, it, it is possible, but it's, I mean, I don't have a number for the kind of upper limit there really. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, one, one, of the, one of the things that surprised me, it took me a long time to find out how um, segmented LCDs, liquid crystal displays, are, are controlled in, in my career. And I was, I was working at a microcontroller company, and, and we had some microcontrollers with a dedicated peripheral, and you have to generate essentially an AC signal. Um, you can't have DC on the pins of the LCD because over time, you know, you can cause damage to it. Is, is this also the case with electrochromic displays? You know, how, what sort of uh, complexity uh, surrounds driving them? Um, no, they are simpler, actually. Um, they are much more straightforward. And they only require signals that can be generated with basically any off-the-shelf MCU. Uh, they, they can operate with, uh, with a normal I.O., uh, but their the only kind of requirement is that there need to be a high impedance mode on that IO, uh, and that can be a little bit different from MCU to MCU. How high impedance the high impedance mode is? Uh, some of them are a little bit too low, and then you can get leakage. You can compensate for that by kind of refreshing the display and stuff like that. But uh, to to get it, uh, you know, ideally uh, optimized, you you want something with with a high impedance high impedance mode. <laughs> But that, that is typically the case for, for most MCUs. Uh, so okay. uh, normally it works with, with basically any MCU. Now, the other thing about liquid crystal displays is, is that that um, AC signal that's generated, it has to be all there all the time in order for the segment to be displayed. Um, you, may, I understand from what you just said, you don't need to drive each segment continuously. So what sort of update rates of, of signal do you need to, um, to keep a segment of, of your technology switched on. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, you're right. And that's also a point where we are, as you say, quite different from LCDs. So our displays are relatively bistable. They, however, need a refresh pulse every now and then to maintain the state. And this could be like approximately once every 15 minutes, a little bit dependent on where you kind of put the uh, your uh, your demands on where, where the lower limit for uh, contrast ratio is. But generally, if you if you refresh it once every 15 minutes, you will not be able to notice any decrease in, in contrast ratio, basically. Um, so and this is this is actually great because that, that means that on a system level you can put the MCU in sleep mode during those 15 minutes. And that is of course great for uh, it saves power basically. So yeah. And is there any disadvantage other than a higher power consumption of, of keeping um, my drive signal there all the time? Can that can I continuous drive d d damage the segments at all? Yeah, that is something that we do not recommend. Um, it's, it depends a little bit on, on the application and the requirements. But for, for devices that should sustain long and have long lifetime, uh, it, it is not, not ideal to, to do like that. Um, you can of course still keep the MCU running and do other stuff, whatever. But but you should you should basically pulse the display to its to a, to a state, and then you should let it be there uh, in high impedance mode, basically. So you should not continuously apply a voltage to it because that introduces uh, some degradation mechanisms that we don't want want to be there, basically. Okay, super. Now these, as you said earlier, I think uh, these are re reflective displays, and that makes them easy to read under normal lighting conditions. But obviously, there's challenges with these displays when um, your application is being used in a room that's not lit. So if there's no ambient yeah. light available, what sort of approaches uh, can people take to illumination? 
Um, yeah, so in this in this situation, we would add a prompt light and a light guiding form, um, which basically means that you add a small LED uh, on the side of the display and the light guide that spreads the, the light of this LED uh, across the surface. And then you will be able to see the display perfectly fine in the darkness as well. Um, but I mean, some, some people ask us if we can add a backlight, basically to put the light behind the display. Uh, that is uh, that is not possible since our display is opaque. It doesn't really work. So we need really a front light. Uh, and also in that in that uh, from that perspective, we are similar to uh, to the uh, technology used in Kindle because there is also that's also a front light that is used for those devices. Right. Okay. And now, um, so wh where are you in terms of 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 um, display? options are, are, are there any sort of off the shelf uh, displays available uh, sort of obviously people are used to having seven segment displays and, and bar graphs and things like that yeah exactly and we have both seven segment displays and bar graph bar graph displays in, in different sizes in our online store um so that's that's uh, possible to buy there and we are actually soon launching five new display modules uh, we'll actually show you uh, here, these are uh, five by seven dot matrix display modules wow. that can be connected together like this. Um, so we are launching five different display modules. This is a five by seven, as I said, and then we are launching eight by eight matrix display modules and also three sizes of seg seven segment display modules. Um, so that's uh, that's something that we will launch quite soon, uh, and that will also be available in our, in our online store. I would like to highlight, though, uh, that we are uh, kind of uh, customization is to some extent in our DNA. So uh, whatever you want to do, uh, if you have a, a specific design, whatever shape you want to do, um, yeah, just just uh, bring it to us and we, we can fabricate it for you as well. It's an important part of our offering to, to be able to do customized displays, definitely. That's really, I, I love those displays that you, you just showed us. They, they look very impressive. So uh, how, how big are they approximately? What dimensions did you say? Yeah, I don't have the numbers here, uh, but they are quite big. You see, <laughs> I'm a normal <laughs> sized person, I guess. So <laughs> if you compare it to me, I can, uh, we can add the, maybe the numbers in the footnote later on. Yeah, I need to exactly. check that. Just wanted to uh, check. But we have design. customers that have put a lot of these. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have customers that have put uh, hundreds of these devices together to form like big billboards and stuff like that. Wow! And it's uh, yeah, that's, that's quite straightforward to do with our uh, built built-in driver that we have yep. here on the back, and also uh, the fact that you can daisy chain them is an important feature. So yep. you only need one kind of master driver here, and then you can uh, send the signal along the displays easily. So. That, that, that leads me to an, another question, actually, because if you're, you know, if you're making a, a huge display based on sort of modules like that, I mean, how how quickly can I change change whether a segment is on and off? I mean, what sort of refresh rate is possible with with something uh, with this technology? Um, yeah, so this this actually depends quite a lot on the uh, on the segment size because the larger the segment is, the slower is the uh, switching speed. Uh, for a small segment like this, for example, that I have here, it's it's uh, quite fast, uh, so it takes a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, whilst for a larger segment, it can take uh, you know one two seconds. In some cases, even a little bit more. Uh, so from from hundred milliseconds to five seconds, I would say, yeah. uh, for really large displays. Then, now you just mentioned as well another point I wanted to address, which was uh, this, the customization um, service that you offer. Could you just take us through how that sort of process works and give us some guidelines on sort of limits on size or symbol dimensions or the spacing between symbols, colors, uh, and things like that? Sure. Um, so all you need to do really is to send us a sketch. And that could be anything from a CAD file to a napkin sketch, if that's what you have. Uh, and then our designers will turn that into a producible display. Um, and we are doing this basically every week. We're producing new display designs. So this is, this is, as I said before, an important part of, of what we want to do. Uh, there is no strict limitation on size, but we have never exceeded an A3 format on a single display. However, as I showed here, it's of course possible to combine multiple displays into a larger display. Um, and when it comes to design guidelines, I would say that there are we're 
quite uh, quite free there. We have uh, designed a stack where, which gives us a lot of freedom. Um, but um, yeah, this is, so the symbol can have basically any shape. But there need to be a certain gap in between the segments. Currently, that gap is 1.5 millimeters. And that, that's a gap that we're trying to reduce as we develop the technology further. Um, but uh, currently, it's 1.5 millimeter. Um, the segments, I think you asked if the segments can overlap, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's at the moment not possible um, and not something we intend to do either. In, in that case, you would do two segments and you would turn on. I mean, if you want to show both, you show both, and otherwise you turn one off, basically. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to colors, uh, we are uh, we can we can create uh, color displays, but we do that in a way where we put the color filter in front of the display. So that means that we make kind of a colored representation of this display. So we can make like red to black segments or green to black segments, stuff like that. But yeah. we cannot make a segment that goes from green to red, for example. Um, so yeah, so no traffic yeah. lights in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so maybe actually we have a quite uh, quite good uh, design guideline that we can maybe we can share in the footnote or, or something like yeah. that uh, if you want to want to see more. Actually, a traffic light is is one of the things that are more or less doable since they are separate segments. We exactly. can actually do that. That's true. Yeah, we <laughs> so, can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, if it, if it would have been one single light switching from red to yellow to green, it would not have been possible. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, this is this is relatively new technology. Um, what sort of applications are you seeing um, that are have the greatest interest in in deploying this at the minute? Um, yeah. So it's it's really from everywhere, uh, basically. But currently, I would say that we're seeing a very very strong interest from um, for large signs. I mean, basically similar to signs to what I showed you public information displays, bus stops, queuing number signs, and similar. Um, and this is because we have a very obvious cost benefit when it comes to really large signs. The larger the display gets, the more obvious is our cost benefit. It's obvious for small displays also, but it's even more important for larger displays. Um, and okay. we are also working with lots of applications for battery-driven data logging devices and monitoring devices. and Another important market where we start to see a strong interest is actually electronic shelf labels that you see in the grocery stores. Yes, um, of course. So. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's a good point with these sort of, uh, there's lots of IoT applications with powered by these little coin cells like a CR2032. Um, and one of the displays that I saw um, in, in your, your offering, one of the standard displays, are these sort of little small bar graph displays about the, the size of your thumbnail, I think, approximately. Um, I mean, if, if, I was, if my application was just powering that display to show, I don't know, temperature or humidity in, in a room on a very basic display, what sort of uh, lifetime can I expect from that? Or is it, is it really as, you know, the, the lifetime of the battery? Yeah, sure. And it's, it's of course, a, a little bit of a, it's a tricky question because it depends so much on the design of the whole system. But if we're assuming that the MCU is consuming zero, basically, uh, the, the battery for a display like this, it would, uh, coin cell CR2032 would last for uh, 10, 20 years, probably 30 years, actually. Um, so. Impressive. Now, one of the other challenges with displays generally is obviously um, that they, they, I think uh, liquid crystal displays, they can become a bit slow, can't they, when, when it gets cold. Um, is, is there anything to consider with, with your type of technology when you're working maybe in very cold or very hot environments? Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we share the same kind of characteristics as LCD there. So in, in colder environments, our switching speed goes down and in higher temperature, uh, it uh, it goes up basically. So so the switch becomes significantly faster in high temperature than in, in negative degrees, for example. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. And then um, one of the other things as, as well was um, obviously L LCD technology. If I turn the segment on, it's on. And if I turn it off, it's off. Is, is there a way to sort of adjust the contrast of a segment with, with, with your um, approach? Yeah, it is. Um, so you, you, can, you can reach like intermediate states by applying um, 
pulses of of voltage that are in between the recommended voltages basically so that is that is definitely doable yeah and is that is that re reproducible over the entire lifetime of the display or, or would you need to sort of compensate for aging maybe if, if you were trying to always get about half contrast or quarter contrast mm. for example yeah no that, that's a that's a good question i think um, we're not we are recommending all our customers now to kind of see the segments as binary in the states uh so and that's partly for the reason that you're mentioning um that we, we think there could be some aging mechanism we can see that to some extent that we have some um, some aging in the displays if they're switching a lot of times um so that that is easy to we have a binary system but when you start to add more levels, exactly as you say, it becomes more complicated. Um, so um, I, I don't dare to say that uh, exactly what and how, how big the difference will be. I think there will be a little bit of a difference, uh, but I think it's definitely possible to make it work with with compensation methods yeah. as you propose. So now on, on this show, we talk a lot about uh, new technologies. We've been talking about silicon carbide transistors and gallium nitride transistors. Um, I've, I've been in industry a long time. We've tried to introduce new packages at something else we've, we've, for, for uh, MOSFETs and things like that. We've talked about that on the show. So uh, if a designer is, is considering replacing whatever display technology they're using today and, and moving to uh, an invisible, base, uh, invisible product, um, what are some of the sort of standard failure modes or sort of gotchas that you need to be aware of as a designer um, when building these systems? Are they just generally very reliable and, and easy to implement? Yeah, I mean, they are they are easy to implement, uh, but it is important to remember, um, I think we touched upon it a little bit before, that even if our displays are super easy to drive, there are some consideration, considerations that need to be taken. And primarily what I'm thinking about here is, is, is about minimizing the pulse length and minimizing the voltage levels to avoid unnecessary degradation to the displays. And this tends to be a little bit of a communication challenge uh, because this is some, I mean, if you come from like an LCD driving perspective, you, you're so used to just uh, continuously applying a signal and then you start using hours and you may be used, you think that you, you may be able to do the same. Right. And that will work for, for a while, uh, but eventually there, there will be issues. Uh, and that's something that we, that we, yeah, we, we try to be super clear to our customers that this is how you need to think about this new technology. But of course, it's a challenge when, when you're introducing a, a new technology like that. So Exactly. Fantastic. Well, thanks for that great introduction uh, to the invisible uh, display, segmented display technology. Stay with us because we're going to um, get you to join us towards the end of the show where we have our roundtable discussion and uh, take a look at some of the questions that our audience provide. So uh, in the meantime, hang on and we'll see you again shortly. Thank you, Raj. So now it's giveaway time. And today we've got a, a great little relevant giveaway. Um, before we do that, I say previously in our last show, we gave away five eBooks from the Elector Library, programming voice controlled IoT applications with Alexa and Raspberry Pi. Congratulations to all of those who took part and won a copy. Now, to extend our thanks to you as Loyal Engineering Insights viewers, for this episode, I have three invisible segment e-paper display kits available. Thin, flexible, and sunlight readable, the kit contains 13 of these innovative displays, along with an I2C-based -squared driver board to operate them. For your chance to win, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword flexible, that's the keyword flexible, with your entry. All the best. Let's bring uh, Jonas back into our stage here. Good to see you, Jonas. Thanks for hanging on there. Thanks. Now, um, solar cells, I would say, are definitely front of mind um, again. In, in Germany, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's a lot of discussion about um, balcony solar, uh, solar energy generation. We're allowed to have very okay. small... Yeah. Um, solar and energy generation hanging on our, our balconies, but it seems to be uh, not that easy to buy or get installed. But as we look at the, the climate crisis and, and look for green in energy generation, I mean, uh, solar solar cells are back there front of uh, front of mind. So, how do Epishine solar cells differ for those from those I'd find, say, as we talked about in the earlier, in, in a calculator or, or even on on the roof of a building? 
Yeah, so very briefly, the solar cells you find on a roof on a building is at least 95% of them probably more uh, are uh, silicon based uh, and, and it's crystalline silicon. So, so basically you, you start with silicon oxide, you remove the oxygen and there you require a really high temperature. You melt this into crystal and then you sort this crystal into sort of wafers that you place uh, in your module and, and then you have a, a really well performing solar cell you, usually the power conversion efficiency is about 20 percent for those uh, if you look at the classical calculators for, for more indoor applications this is usually uh, amorphous silicon and amorphous silicon uh, perform uh, slightly better than the crystalline silicon at low light so basically the, the crystalline silicons absorbs very much of, of the ir uh, near ir uh, from the sun, meaning that you can get a lot of current, but, but uh, you lose a bit in uh, voltage because indoors, uh, where you have the more silicon, uh, you don't have any IR light. You basically uh, only have uh, LED and, and fluorescent light sources, meaning that you have emission in the visible part of the spectra. And for Epichine solar cells, uh, we are all targeted for, for the indoor markets as well. And, and uh, just like uh, Invisible, we are using um, printed electronics to manufacture our solar cells. Standard product looks something uh, like this. It's 0.2 millimeter uh, flexible and, and uh, performs really well under uh, typical indoor illumination. So um, what sort of, uh, I don't know, if efficiency um, or, or how, how do you sort of measure the performance yeah. of, of a solar cell? Of an of a indoor solar cell. So, so outdoors, it's usually uh, in percentage. Indoors, you can use that also. Uh, outdoors, you also use the, the watt per square meter. Uh, indoor, it's typically smaller devices. So, so we're talking about microwatts uh, per square centimeter. And then you need to define light intensity. And that's usually measured in lux indoors. And typical indoor illumination is somewhere between 10 and 1,000 lux, uh, I would say. And this is also the area uh, where we have optimized our solar cell. And, and this is sort of the light power density. Uh, that's vi the, the visible light power density that's measured in, in lux. And, and if you take a reference for, for 500 lux, uh, you can get a bit more than 20 microwatts out of a square centimeter of this solar cell. So, so this device typically gives you uh, 420, uh, 450. Uh, microwatts them. Super. And 500 wow. looks would then correspond to sort of typical office illumination. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what sort of cell, uh, solar cell dimensions um, are then supported in, in your current uh, product lineup? In our current product lineup, we have this one and, and then sort of this uh, aperture area that defines the active area is uh, 50 by 50 square millimeter. We also have one version 50 by 30 and one 50 by 20 square millimeter. And this is sort of the standard sortiment, but then uh, we also do a lot of different custom designs. Uh, squares uh, and rectangles are, are the most efficient from a yield perspective, but, but we have also looked into round ones, uh, versions uh, with holes, etc. And quite recently, we also uh, released what we call one cell, uh, which looks sort of a little bit different and, and better. Okay. So, uh, I mean, Bearing in mind that you sort of offer that customization as well, um, although you you know you're, you're targeting indoor um, mm. solar energy generation, uh, are, are sort of people coming to you and are you exploring sort of larger uh, installations uh, as well, or, or or are you really just targeting sort of low power uh, requirement IoT type applications? Yeah, yeah. Power, power in the, in the <laughs> yeah. In the in the phase we are at right now, I would say it's mainly targeted for, for uh, facility automation, uh, IoT connected uh, sensors, uh, also looking a bit at electronic shelf labels, remote controls. Typically, I would say is is sort of the area, and and this is uh, today where where we focus all of our efforts. Uh, for the future uh, strategy, I mean, we see that uh, printed photovoltaics uh, could could have a great potential also for for other applications. And our vision is to, to also manufacture um, large area solar cells uh, for, for other applications. But today, uh, it, it's very much focused then on the on the smaller uh, indoor uh, devices. You see, I have to ask the question because we have some mm -hmm. very clever people out there watching, <laughs> and they'll <laughs> they'll see what you have on offer and, and come up with some some crazy ideas that they want to implement. Yeah. So, just want to make sure we we know what's actually available and supported today. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the solar cells, te- solar cell technology, it, it, can these be used then as a standalone power source or, or, or is it sort of advised always to use them with like a, an energy harvesting chipset or some sort of... Um, DC, yeah, DC usually you, you need some kind of little electronics around it. We, we have, for instance, um, uh, this uh, evaluation kit where, where there is a, a small supercapacitor uh, connected to the solar cell and a little bit of electronics. And this way you can basically take this evaluation kit, take the batteries out of your product and, and directly connect this one. Uh, but typically you need either some kind of discrete electronics or, or a, a PMIC um, to help you uh, to, to optimize the, the power output from the solar cell. And, and pending the application, uh, there is a few different versions that, that work uh, quite well. Uh, but I would say that typically you need a little bit of electronics or PMIC and also usually a small supercapacitor, hybrid capacitor or a small rechargeable battery if you want to make sure that you can also generate power when it's dark or if you have peak powers, uh, for instance, for, for your uh, radio uh, that requires a bit more uh, power than the solar cell uh, continuously generate. Yeah. And are there any sort of um, PMIC um, manufacturers that you've you've used and have had uh, success with, or your customers? Hi, indeed, indeed. On a Absolutely. Basis? I mean, uh, EPs has a set of, of uh, quite nice ones. Uh, Atmosic uh, also have had PMICs that, that uh, work really well. Uh, and and then for microcontrollers uh, or or VLE uh, radios, I would say that that Nordic also offer a, a quite nice um, versions here. So so I would say that this is some examples. Uh, of of uh, uh, interesting choices. Now, obviously, uh, the, this sort of application only works if if um, you're able to, yeah, sort of uh, make the assumption about where the application is going to be used by your customers. So, if we yep. were sort of having a, let's say we're having a, a, a TV remote control, obviously we don't know mm. what everybody's living room is or bedroom is where that that's going to be located. So, mm-hmm. how do you suggest designers should go about? assessing um, which Epishine, Epishine solar cell is going to best work for their application and, and how, how can they go about determining, you know, how much light is enough light? Mm-mm. Now, I think it's a, it's a very good question. And, and here we have a, a team uh, that we refer to as our product integration team, where, where we have electronics and, and mechanical engineers that typically work with the question how to electronically and mechanically integrate the solar cell into the product and also to, to uh, advise the, uh, our customers on what size and what type of, uh, of our solar cells or light cells uh, they should use. And to answer the question in terms of light availability, we have collected a lot of data ourselves. Um, So we have a a database uh, with with, uh, looks intensity measurement or looks uh, measurements done over time uh, for a number of different occasions. uh, So so we can guide a little bit there. Uh, Then we also uh, can help to support uh, with looks loggers for for customers who who would like uh, to, to measure themselves. Uh, we have also developed uh, what we call uh, Sven, uh, but, uh, here. Uh, and, and this device uh, we can also uh, use together uh, with, with potential customers. Uh, and this will then measure the temperature, uh, the lux levels, uh, and also uh, calculate the, the harvested energy uh, from the light cell uh, in these applications. Uh, but then, of course, as you say, it will vary. So, so you need to, to sort of look at your corner uh, cases, etc., uh, to, to make sure that, that you can dimension the, the size of the light cell in a, in a proper way. Yeah. And then we have a really good team that, that can, can support with that as well. Fantastic. The, mm-hmm. I mean, what, one of the other challenges with these sort of applications, and it's something we've covered on the show before, is, is measuring the power consumption mm-hmm. and building an application power profile for these really low power applications. Do you have any sort of recommendations of test equipment um, that you've used that's been sort of helpful in doing that? What's your team using um, for Uh, to to basically look at the the power requirement for your device? You mean? Yeah, or or the power consumption in operation to sort of monitor the electronic device. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we're starting to to leave my my expertise area a little bit here. Uh, I'm within the, the solar cell material and and how they work. And, and uh, my colleagues in the, in the product integration team uh, are yeah. more the expert on, on these parts. So I think I have to refer that question uh, to them 
Uh, <laughs> we can come back to that another time and do yeah, another indeed. another show on, on yeah. that. Um, so then, to come back to the materials, you you said um, you know that custom uh, solar cells can also be manufactured. Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, what sort of guidelines do you have? What, where are the the limits? What's what's possible, and, and what can you immediately say no to when when um, people sort of come up with questions around a customizable uh, solar cell? I indeed. I, I mean, I would say if, if you want things smaller than a watch, then, then uh, uh, probably uh, there are uh, other uh, uh, producers that have been better, or I would say quite much smaller than that one. Uh, and that uh, then in times of uh, width and length, I would say that, that uh, right now uh, we can do things up to about 0.3 meter wide and uh, uh, somewhere around... Uh, 50 centimeter long could be uh, also up to a meter but what i would say is is sort of most applications it's uh, somewhere around a credit card sized solar cell so, so it's somewhere uh, around this size still uh, i would say and then we can manufacture round cells of course but then i mean if you have something round you will always have more waste than, than if you have something rectangular uh, so, so it will uh, not be as efficient use, but, but then if the design is important, then, then of course that's possible to, to, to do as well. And also small cutouts, etc. Now, obviously, being a, a plastic film based technology, mm -hmm. as you said, that the, the cells are flexible. What sort mm -hmm. of level of um, curvature, I'm not quite sure what radius of, of curvature is, is allowed. Yep. And, and also, if, if something was flexing regularly, um, yep. How, yep. how much? regular flexing is is um, what yeah, what can you do <laughs> how far yeah. can we go yeah how far can we go no so so to to basically get a feeling for this we, we purchased a a sort of bending test i mean i guess you've seen this sort of chair testers that uh, go uh, some something similar and and uh, a machine that's basically been bending down this solar cell uh, around a radius of uh, bending radius of of uh, one centimeter uh, we started out with tests, uh, making a thousand bands. Uh, nothing happened basically on the power conversion efficiency. Uh, stepped up to ten thousand bands, still basically no no impact on on the uh, power density of the of the or power output from the solar cell. And after there, we we stopped. So so um, bending seems to be okay, but but it's basically bending. It it's still a, a um, flexible but but not stretchable device. So, so bending in in one direction or along uh, one axis. Uh, works very well. <laughs> Super. And yeah. it, I mean, you, obviously, the, like that's the the aging. There doesn't seem to be an aging effect on on flexing. No, it, indeed. The, if I flex it, do I see maybe a change in voltage output um, caused by the flexing and not by the change in in, in light energy hitting it, or? Again, ah, yeah, indeed. So, so of course, depending on sort of the, the light projection on the solar cell, if it's flat directed, uh, you, you're going to have more. And then if you tilt it, there will be a projection. You will have slightly less if you flex it like this, etc. So, so always uh, depending on sort of where you have your light source and, and how the solar cell is oriented versus that one, it will yeah. affect the the, uh, uh, the power output. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the one of the interesting things or challenges around um, around sort of flexible circuits is as well is how mm. you electrically attach them in, into your circuit. Uh, can I yep. can I solder these to my board or is it best to use a, like a zero force connector or what what do your customers? Yeah, do? let's see if it's possible. Uh, so you see, there are two small uh, punch through contacts uh, on this uh, light cell. Let's see if I'm uh, so one here and the other one up here. Uh, and these ones uh, are indeed uh, solderable, and and we are also working on uh, on a next version uh, where we uh, have have small openings uh, that that you can uh, uh, either uh, glue or or solder your contact uh, directly to uh, as well. Super. Um, mm -hmm. Now, one one of the other things that comes to mind is because um, we're talking about the flexible robustness. Um, mm -hmm. But what what about if I wanted to use um, use this for an outdoor application? Is uh, mm -hmm. is there anything to consider there, or do you sort of recommend having some sort of uh, some translucent cover to protect it from the elements, or or can it on its own be um, be be left outside in the rain? Yeah. So basically, what we have is is we we have encapsulated it uh, with barrier foils, uh, and and this is basically PET films uh, with a thin coating. 
uh, to uh, slow down the ingress of uh, moisture and oxygen and, and this way they uh, get a good lifetime. Uh, for outdoor applications, uh, basically these are designed for, for indoor applications. So the um, conductors um, in the electrodes that, that transport and generate the generated photocurrent laterally over the device, uh, it's organic materials uh, and they work uh, really well up to a couple of thousand looks. Uh, but above that, you, you start to get omega losses uh, in these ones. Uh, so for outdoor applications, you will have a quite limited um, power conversion efficiency. And, and our recommendation uh, on this product is to, to uh, use it for, for indoor applications. Can be, of course, possible to use it in, in uh, shadow applications, outdoor, etc. But, but uh, mainly for, for uh, indoor. Yeah. Hmm. So we're unfortunately we're rush, rapidly running out of time. It's so interesting to, yeah. to have all these <laughs> points and, and get so much information all in, all in one go. So one one last question uh, to you hmm. on this: um, If you look at a, a solar powered calculator, I mean they always have that that little sort of brownie beige purple mm -hmm. sort of solar cell, and it's always got three little bars on it. It doesn't look very pretty, um, at least from a, a product designer's point of view. Is it possible with your technology to maybe uh, make it look a little bit more interesting or, or hide mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some sort of yeah. cover or I something and what still get enough light? Where are you going at? So I would say that this is sort of examples of, of our uh, standard products uh, or standard products. This is uh, first customer products uh, that's out on the market. Um, temperature and, and humidity sensors uh, from, from companies ILSYS and uh, M Climate. Uh, using our solar cells and then if you would like to get something even more uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, it's possible to put sort of this type of cover foils on top of it also to get a more uh, light gray uh, nuance for instance like this one uh, the price you pay is that you have less uh, light transmitted so, so in this case uh, you lose somewhere around 40 or 50 percent uh, of, of the transmitted light and thereby also 40 50 percent of the generated power uh, yeah. This is basically a trade-off, and then there is possible to add other types of surfaces, so so you get a little bit other type of of reflectance and and texture uh, on top of the solar cell as well, then uh, to make it look a bit nicer. Super. Well, thanks ever mm -hmm. so much. Um, it's it's really exciting to see a sort of a, a new um, alternative uh, solar cell technology, and um, I think one of the most exciting things is is that it can be sort of fault or sort of flexed. And, and mm -hmm. give uh, product designers at least a, a new opportunity to integrate them into into applications in a different way. So super. I'm going to bring Philip back in. He's been waiting patiently here in the background. So welcome back, Philip. Good to have you here. Thank you. It was very interesting actually to listen to Jonas. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. the same for both. Mutual. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> so much. And said, All right. And, and uh, I think one of the interesting things is that both of these technologies are essentially, if I understood correctly, being manufactured in the in the same way. Isn't isn't that right, Philip? That the, the both are, are what we call a roll to roll manufacturing technology. Yeah. Sure. Sure. It's it's very similar from that perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So take us a bit through because um, you 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 have like this large this manufacturing re resources uh, for for this technology. Um, take us a bit through what uh, for people who've never heard of roll to roll before. What what does it mean? What what uh, what can be done with it beyond the the things that we're looking at here? Um, who who uses roll to roll technology? Um, yeah, should I should I answer that or? <laughs> yeah. Was it me? yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, roll to roll technology is, basically means that you start off with a roll of substrate in one end of the production line. So, in our case, we may start with like one kilometer of PET plastic, for example. Wow. And then we run it through a, a set of production processes. Uh, in, in our case, it is uh, screen printing, but there could be other types of uh, coating processors there also. Uh, but we use screen printing for our display. Uh, and then you run it through some uh, yeah, like curing processes that could be thermal, UV, stuff like that. Uh, and then in the end, you end up with uh, with a final roll of one kilometer of display, basically, or whatever component you're producing. Yeah. So the kind of printed electronics, electronic industry has developed, starting to have a, a kind of wide var var uh, variety of inks uh, that, that you can use. Some of them are off the shelf. Some of them we develop internally. 
um, and by combining these inks in different layers, printing different layers on top of each other, uh, we can build uh, electrical systems like a display or like a solar cell, so, for example. Okay, and then when when it comes to actually um, sort of cutting out the the individual things that you've printed, do you have sort of like a, a stamp or, or do you use laser cutters to cut them out? What, how does that process work? Because that's a lot of work once you've once you've printed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Exactly. So then, yeah, that's a good question. So then there's a conversion step, finally, at the end of the process, where we mechanically stamp them out, as you say. But that's also, it's possible to do that with lasers also. Uh, but uh, mechanical stamping is, is very efficient and also not that, that uh, expensive. The only problem is that you need to buy a new tool every time. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, you, we, you, they are not very expensive. So you win that in the gains that you do from a kind of... Uh, conversion speed perspective. Yeah. Uh, but if you want something that is even more flexible, you would go for a laser solution, I guess. Yeah. So Jonas, we, we, mm -hmm. when I was talking to Philip and also in, in the giveaway in the middle, we, we sure saw the uh, invisible um, the sort of evaluation kit. Mm -hmm. If somebody wanted to try out the, the Epishine solar cells, um, what's mm -hmm. the best way for someone to go about doing that? And, and where can they get them from? Yeah, simple, simplest and fastest, I would say, is to, to go to Fornell, uh, their web store. Uh, there you can purchase uh, both uh, this type of uh, solar cells and, and also our evaluation kit uh, are for sales there. And, and then uh, if you are interested in uh, other uh, shapes, designs uh, at, at a bit larger volumes, more than welcome to contact uh, our, our sales teams uh, also, uh, which uh, is easy to find on, on our homepage. Super. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, now, what, one of the things that Electro's been looking at of late uh, is ethics in electronics, and that's everything from from how we work with individuals, uh, individuals personally, and how companies run their businesses and their cultures, all the way to packaging uh, delivery of products. Philip, what I wanted to ask you was a, a, about product recycling. If if someone was, um, you know, the companies are now having to look closer at the materials they're using and where they're sourced from, and also what we're going to do with them end of life. Um, what sort of recommendations are there about um, end of life of of the displays that you manufacture and, and what to how to recycle them? Yeah, um, this is a little bit outside of my scope, I would say. So I am not, uh, I may not be the right person to to answer that. Uh, but what I do know is that our materials are very, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, eco friendly uh, from that yeah. perspective. So it's it's not a it's not a hard thing to to handle the end of life uh, situation basically. And of course, you know, rows, reach, and those things we we have that for our displays and the materials that are going into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, other details I don't know about, so yeah, I would yeah. have to refer to our CTO there, I think. Yeah, no problem. Super. And then, um, Jonas, um, when it comes to sort of energy harvesting, what sort of, um, do, do you have any resources, uh, that, um, that your team uses or that you have on your own website, maybe to sort of advise how to go beyond just the solar cell and, and, uh, make the most of every electron that it can produce? Absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we have a dedicated uh, team for this uh, that we call uh, product integration. So, so they, there we have um, electronic engineers, uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, they're also really good in, in supporting uh, in terms of light availability, etc. Uh, and uh, easiest to get in contact with them via our, our, our uh, sales department as well. Uh, that they have gotten a, a lot of really uh, positive feedback from, from potential customers uh, with the support they can provide. Super. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you both very, very much uh, for everything you shared with us today. It's been really insightful and uh, great to see uh, some, something very different and, and new um, on, on the market. I think the, the flexibility is, is uh, really cool in, in both cases. And uh, it's, I think it offers a whole bunch of new opportunities for product designers and electronics engineers trying to fulfill, fulfill their dreams of, of making nice, uh, nice to look at products. So super. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very Thank much you for much. watching us. Well, that's all we have time for today in this episode. So what did we learn? Hard, brittle displays and solar cells can be a thing of the past. Thanks to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing techniques, how we make some of our electronic components is changing. 
In turn, that opens up new possibilities. We no longer need to accept that a solar cell is rigid, allowing our products to be curved. And the same applies to displays, enabling information to be shared from thin surfaces or on rounded objects. Both are ideal, are ideal for low power applications that hopefully can completely eliminate batteries in some cases. And the displays are fully customizable, ensuring your product's brand, look and feel can be retained as are the solar cells. So my thanks go out to today's experts, Philip Holgerson from Invisible and Jonas Bergfist from Epishine. You've delivered us some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining. Stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions. <laughs>